All right. So welcome everyone to uh, the Sprint France's um, newly started presentations. We're trying to reach everybody through this online format with Zoom, um, as opposed to, you know, obviously now that we can't all gather personally, but this might actually get more people in the community to be able to attend, which is great. My name is Seta Kazanjian. I'm the president of Sprint. And uh, for those of you, because I think we have some, some people attending who are not very familiar with Sprint yet, we are an association of professionals uh, ranging from psychologists, teachers, different types of therapists like speed therapists, occupational therapists, art therapists, movement therapists, who, um, as well as learning support specialists who work with children and families. And we aim to serve as both a network for these professionals so we can learn from each other about new techniques and strategies and laws and all that, but as well as uh, providing um, help and support referral services, um, helping families who've moved here on how to get services for their children who have more special needs or additional requirements, you know, medical or educational needs. Um, and so today we've got um, a wonderful presentation by Elle Stahl on systemic art therapy. And she'll tell us all about systemic art therapy. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. I don't want to get any of these acronyms wrong. Um, so Els is, has been a Sprint member for quite a while. She's one of our uh, very active members. Um, she has been um, a member, uh, she is an art therapist, a certified uh, art therapist, and she received her degree, her DU, from the Paris 8 Université in Systemic Family Therapy. Um, she's originally from Netherlands. She also lived in New York and has lived in Paris since 1992. She works part-time at the, one of the CESADs uh, near Pantin, which is a center for children prevent, pre presenting with behavioral issues. And she also has a private practice in Pantin where she offers individual and family therapy. Um, now today, just to give you a quick overview of what we will learn about, what you will discover, is um, that all about um, art therapy, then an active and creative type of therapy, which help, that helps children and their families during a psychologically difficult period. Um, we'll learn about some concepts of the systemic therapy approach, what systemic art therapy is, the simple art materials used, good indications for systemic art therapy, why working with the parents is so important for the child, and uh, there will be slides that will il illustrate some concrete examples of therapeutic propositions that she makes. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to leave this uh, pass on to Els, who will present. And for those of you, again, for those of you who come in a little bit later, um, please keep your microphones off and your cameras off as this is recorded. Um, and will be available for viewing uh, later on by others. So just for privacy sakes, keep your cameras off. Um, if you have questions uh, during the presentation, you're welcome to enter it in the chat function and I'll keep an eye on them. Um, or you can hold on to your question and ask them at the end, um, or you can unmute yourself and ask her directly. Um, and then for those of you here who are Sprint members, remember that we're gonna stay online after uh, the presentation at uh, six o'clock for our regular meeting. Okay, and thank you, Els. Thank you, Sita. Thank you for everyone who is there. Um, I'm going to talk about systemic art therapy, which is a creative experiential approach for families with children, sometimes with young children. Um, trying to make the screen, yes. Okay, so we'll be presenting the, the origin of this approach, uh, the specific qualities, indications, uh, the child within its family system, therapeutic goals and propositions, combining it with other approaches, and the last word about video sessions in this period of confinement. The origin of this art, uh, systemic art therapy approach comes from, from two corners. One is the art therapy one, that was developed after the Second World War, 
um, I am an art therapist in fine arts. Um, it is very useful uh, for working when verbal expression is difficult. Verbal exp the, the creative expression helps also to heal. Um, it can uh, let feelings and needs emerge in a different way. It can also serve to reconstruct oneself through the creation. And it's not at all about art. In fact, in Holland, it is called creation or creative therapy. Then there's the systemic approach, which was developed at, in more or less the same period, uh, mostly by Palo Alto, the school. Um, in 52, that school was, was initiated. It talks a lot about humans and their systems, and it's based on a lot of research coming from all kinds of different uh, uh, professions. It has done a lot of research on relationships and it has given a new view of how to understand the interactions between humans. In the 80s, a Dutch art therapist called Frans Belen uh, combined the two approaches. Uh, she was working in a center with families with young children and she developed uh, an approach in 10 um, sessions, more or less, uh, which offers a lot of parent support and which help, which uses, which really needs the parents to get the system working. When we talk about uh, systems, systemic therapy, there are as many systems as we have activities and, and connections. The most important system for every human being is the system of the family that we grew up in. Besides that, there is the family of the mother, there's the family of the father, then there are the friends of dad and mom, then there are, there's like the world around dad, his colleagues, the tennis, around mom, colleagues, the therapist, yoga, and school, um, and so the parents of the children going to school with the children can also be an important system. These systems help us to exist. We need the systems to feel um, that we exist, that we are appreciated. Uh, it is through these systems that we feel well. Um, before systemic therapy, um, the, the interactions of, of humans between them was usually seen as linear. When person A provokes person B, the result is that person B can become aggressive. With systemic work, we look upon relationships as a more circular happening. When A is trying to control person B, person B can increase behavior such as drinking. But the drinking will have person A try to control more, which will have person B drink more, etc. Or to the right of that, you can see this system, which is more complicated, um, with more people. Um, we can have a, a child brought into therapy uh, with symptoms, such as the child is losing concentration and is getting into fights uh, at school or outside school. This might lead to a father becoming more dominant. When the father becomes dominant, the mother can become can be in a position of submission. This reduces uh, the the risk of fights between father and mother. Um, but mother might get closer to the child by helping him more or her more with homework. But this makes the couple uh, more tense again because the father feels that mother and child are getting closer. Subconsciously, the child. We'll look for solutions. I'm hearing a noise. Okay. So the child subconsciously will increase its symptoms. It will even fight more so that dad and mom will be less fighting between them. Now, if we look at this circular movement of parents and time, we can think about this movement as a spiral. Families can get stuck into negative spirals, but they can also grow towards positive spirals. And that is what therapy is about. 
When I receive families the first time, I put very simple art materials on the, on the table, uh, such as some modeling paste, some markers, some color pencils, and typically, after having listened and received the demand, the initial demand of the family, um, I often propose uh, for every family member to tell me about the positive qualities of the family sitting to his right or his left. So we, we make a turn between family members. Um, with this particular family, the mother had called me beforehand telling me that the adolescent daughter uh, was having suicidal thoughts. When the family came into the office, everything was fine. In fact, it was a perfect family. But when I looked at the production of the son, who was a little bit younger than, than the girl, they are both adolescents, I asked myself questions at the portrait that he made of his father. As systemic therapists, we try to form hypotheses. These are feelings, impressions that we need to check with the family. Um, but when I look at the portrait of this father who claims this, that his family is so loving and so perfect, the feeling that I get is a bit of, oh, of worry. So that's something I, I keep in mind. The father also has lots of ideas. So, and indeed, he turned out to be a person full of resources. This uh, systemic art therapy approach um, has allowed me several tools to observe families. Because when people talk, they say one thing, like on the telephone, within the session, um, words are transmitted to me. But words only make up 20% of our communications. Studies have been done, and in fact, we are communicating for 80% with non-verbal communication, such as body language, such as our interactions with others. And I can also look at the creations. This can sometimes give clues either to me, but also sometimes to the family members. So I have both words. I have um, saying and doing as observation tools, but also as work tools. And you will see that later on in some examples, some slides of the work that families have been making. Other qualities of systemic art therapy is that it is experiential. You have to use your body, your hands to make something. And this helps integrate experience and new behavior. It also creates movement. And this might help families to unblock those who are stuck. For example, in verbal fighting, as one can find in families with adolescents or with family members that are not communicating verbally, sometimes proposing creations for families together can provide them with a new link. It is also fun, and sometimes it can lower the anxiety that people can have for therapy. For example, at the moment, I have a family with a father who is addicted to hard drugs. So far, the mother and the daughter have been uh, following therapy, but the father has always refused. Art therapy and systemic art therapy has allowed this man to come to therapy for the very first time. And it turns out that in fact, he has creative qualities. It, it, it can also improve self-esteem. What I try to offer to families are very simple materials and very simple propositions which can lead to success experiences. This is what the materials table looks like when I propose an observation session for parents, for families. This is something that I ask permission for um, and I explain that I will not give them a, a, um, a proposition for that day, um, but that I will just observe them doing things as they are used to do uh, within their family and that it will help us to find the therapeutic goals together. So there's some paper, there's some scotch, there are, there's like tape and 
very simple materials, some, some cotton, some cardboard. This was an observation session with a family of four, two young children, elementary school, uh, of which the daughter is um, presenting selective mutism. She still nowadays speaks at home, but she has stopped speaking at school since um, since école maternelle, uh, so since four years old. And the, the selectiveness becomes more and more important. In this session, all four family members um, contributed to making this work, which they chose to do uh, themselves. So I can, I can compliment them and say, look, this is really what you can do. Um, at a certain point, the mother sat back and she observed, but it was as if I felt sadness in her. Um, there was a moment of conflict between the brother and the sister. The parents did not try to help the children solve this conflict. So these are, and I'm not in, intervening during this session, I just, I take notes. After, and at the end, uh, the daughter uh, with black uh, pencil made this corner because before she had been drawing in her own corner. So this girl who doesn't uh, talk openly in the session towards me does make herself heard and seen in, in other ways. These observations are shared with the parents, me and the parents, when the children are young. The children are not present because I will support the parents in preparing the next session, which will contain a proposition that I have prepared the parents for so that they can really take on their role as a parent and guide their children through the creation. So we see together after the observation session what works and what behavior we would like to be improved or added. When parents are involved in the setting of the therapeutic goals, they are much more motivated. Some indications for systemic art therapy, and there are lots of surprises, um, because this selective muteness was not something that I'd ever thought about. Self-confidence issues, difficulty to keep one's place, uh, children that play alone, uh, during the, the pause at school uh, or after school, change in concentration at school, anger fits, sadness, crying, anxiety. I'm going from indications from younger children to a bit more older children towards adolescence. Uh, feelings of guilt, of injustice, extreme shyness or boasting or lying. Psychosomatic symptoms, more seen in girls than boys. Nightmares and sleep issues. Uh, bedwetting or encopresis or selective uh, wetting or encopresis, which, which can mean that it's only at home but not at school. It's only with dad but not with mom. Unusual repetitive behaviors, such as a boy that I will talk about uh, later, who was hiding, hiding at home so well that his parents wouldn't find him, would have trouble finding him. De depression, negative thoughts, behavior issues, the bad child, the scapegoat child, but also the child that one tends to, uh, to forget sometimes, the very perfect child. child. Children who isolate themselves, who have little friends, or are losing their friends, or are, who have school phobia, then dangerous or self-destructive behavior, sometimes suicide attempts or suicide thoughts, eating disorders, substance abuse, and addictions. Individual therapy is often asked when people, uh, usually one of the parents calls me or writes to me by mail, asking me to work with a child who has this or that problem, and could you please help the child to get rid of this problem? So then I ask questions. I sometimes spend 20 minutes during the first telephone call to trying to understand what is going on. When it turns out that the child itself has had a painful or a traumatic experience, 
Sometimes individual therapy with the child can be indicated. But when there is no logical, no clear indication, no trauma that can be mentioned, I tell parents that the cause might be elsewhere, perhaps in the family, and that the family is the best tool that I can have to help their child. And that if their child is in difficulty, that most likely the entire family is suffering from it. And usually people agree with that. Now there is a counterindication uh, for systemic art therapy because verbal work is very important in this semi-directive approach. So systemic art therapy is not really, really recommended for families that are dealing with psychoses. For example, people suffering or either parents or children suffering from delusions, from hallucinations, from extreme suspiciousness. Um, people who have difficulty separating, distinguishing reality from their own sometimes very strong ideas. Intellectually disabled people, with them it is also very difficult to apply this approach. So the autism spectrum is difficult for this approach. Now something about systemic view on different types of family. In French, they are called famille dysfonctionnelle, dysfunctional families. I really think that all families are trying to survive in the very best way they can. It's really, it's, it's sometimes very touching to see how families do their best to find solutions for difficult situations. But the child can be brought to me on a tray with very strong symptoms. What do those symptoms tell us? And that is sometimes at the core of the family therapy. What is the symptom telling us? We can see, like if we look at the first at this first model of the family, um, we can see, let's say, the healthy enough functioning family, where there is a clear um, boundary between the parents and the children, but where there is a connection with the outside world, which can be a resource for the family and for the, as well parents as well for the children. But then when we look at the enmeshed family, a family that has gone through difficulty or trauma, one reaction can be to go with all energy towards the inside and to exclude the outside world, which can be seen and felt as, as very dangerous. This often has the result of the, um, the, the diminishing of the boundary between the dads, the moms and the children. This can lead, for example, to children that sleep in the bed uh, with their parents. This can lead to parents uh, smoking joints with their adolescents. This leads to unclearness of the position of the parent and the child, enmeshed families, closed towards the outside world. And then the opposite, the disengaged families, which we can call the dry sand families. It, it slips through your fingers, there is no link. There is much less link also between the two parents and also between the kids who are described as very independent but when you go further and symptoms come you find that there is there is no support within the family and that there are that the family members among them are no resources now this is the work of a father um, i asked the family to present me with the qualities of the person to their right, and the father didn't hear uh, this, this request. Instead, he made an image of the family. And this, to me, gives me the information that this is very likely an enmeshed family. There's almost no distinguishing anymore between who is the parent and who is the child. When a child comes in with a symptom, I sometimes have the family make this second drawing. I ask family members to make a drawing of a bottle each. I then explain to them that a family is like an ensemble of bottles. 
like in the communicating vessels principle that some of us have, have been taught in physics class. When the water of the family is calm, the water does not come out of the bottles. The family is, is tranquil. When tension is building up for whatever reason, but this can, crisis, moments of crisis can appear in families when there are changes um, in the family. Um, like a new child is born. Children go to school for the first time. Children leave home. These are big changes in families. So dad and mom are usually adults who have learned to regulate their emotions. That is what the corks are representing. The elder children often also have learned to regulate their emotions. But the child who has not learned to regulate his emotions, or who has not, who is functioning like a sponge for all the tension that it feels and, and gets inside, that child will show symptom and it can be like, the bubbles will come out in the bottle of that child. And that's the symptom child that is often assigned as the problem child. Children can have their place, but they can also have functions. Functions that help the family to survive in a difficult period. This mother explains in image, also in volume, how she felt that her father was. He was giving peak, he was like very sharp. He was often in a very bad mood when he would come back from home. They'd be scared from, of him. And the mother, she described in first instance as someone very soft, but in fact also as, as jealous. So I asked her what the positions of the children were and she, or what functions they could do, how did they react in that family? So she described that the first one was l'enfant qui reçoit les foudres, the child who would get the thunder and the lightning of, of, of the family, um, mostly of the father. So she'd be the kicking ball. The second child, a son, would function as the father when the real father would be absent. The third child, this mother, was very emotional. She'd cry, she'd have crying fits, go to her room, slam her door and cry, cry. And the fourth child, the last one, was assigned as a good for nothing. So, these are roles, this, and this is all subconscious. The family tries to survive as best as it can. Sometimes it is helpful to have different materials and have people look for the materials that corresponds to the feeling that they have when they talk about a certain family member, and then to realize what their real place was, how they suffered, and also which their strengths, strengths are. Sometimes families come to me and they are not open to the, to the idea of um, family therapy. That was the case of this child who had behavioral issues. So I said, okay, I will receive her four times, then I will receive you as parents and we'll see together how we will continue to work. The child in the beginning had the need of crushing. In the beginning, these were seeds, uh, and then it was charcoal, black charcoal, exploding, and then she would get it back again and explode it again. And in another session, she asked for ink. And in this ink session came to the surface, Papa, Maman, 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 Papa. So this I talked about, I'm not showing work of children to the parents. Um, and we decided, because these parents were, were separated, to do sessions with one parent with the child and then the other parent with the child. Working with parents is so important because the parent's well-being is felt by the child. Children are sponges. Parents are really effective tools for me and I need them. I need them to be part of, of the whole because children are so loyal to their parents. I also want to prevent the child to be in a position of 
loyalty conflict, which sometimes happens in the institution when several professionals are working with the child and the child would like to satisfy us, but it would also like to help its parents to survive. Working with the parents, one can help take away the negative self-images that many parents have of themselves, underlining their qualities, reassuring them. Franz Behlen says in her book, 50% of success actions is enough. Your child will learn. Parents, we, we help parents to understand the child also, to learn about child development, and to have child adapted expectations because a child that doesn't do what the parent wants it to do is often a child that isn't ready, that can't yet do what the parent would like it to do. I also often explain that limits are very important. Love is also limits. Limits are also love. Offering support to parents means offering sometimes to the marital couple and also to the parenting couple, also when couples are separated. Okay, so when parents are separated, I often propose to, because the, the child is often living apart with one parent and then with another parent. So I think that working um, in parent-child therapy um, uh, with the parents um, coming in one out of two sessions is the most effective way. In the left uh, proposition, I proposed, so this was elaborated with the mother before this session, I asked her what is a subject that interests both your daughter and you? And she explained that it was the water, the sea. So I proposed to her to make an environment for the child that would represent the sea, the water. So these are water plants. And then she, she is the one who presents the, the proposition to the child. I, I, add, I help the parents to be in the parent position. Um, and the child didn't make fish, but she made little airplanes. And together with the mother, she chose the positioning of the airplanes in this water environment. The second proposition was a father um, with his daughter. There I worked out with the father a proposition where the father would make a barn, would make a shelter, and the child would make an animal that would have to go into the shelter. It took several lambs, because this is a lamb, and I don't know if you can see it. The lamp is smiling. Um, it took a while to get the lamp sufficiently small to fit into the shelter. But the father st stuck to, to the proposition and stimulated his daughter to make um, uh, an object that would really fit into the shelter. These are examples of therapeutic goals, and I will show more images afterwards of, of the realizations. We try to take negative feelings away, whether this is for the parents, the grandparents, or the children, by contextualizing. When families understand that difficult behavior has appeared because the social, economical, um, context was difficult or the family context was difficult they can let go sometimes of this feeling of guilt which is not positive and explaining that everyone is doing his best I recognize and welcome everyone's feelings and needs so this is really the systemic way of working with every family member that has the right to be understood and heard in some families the real communication has stopped. For example, in families where one or two family members talk, talk, talk. And this can be um, a survival mechanism of protection in order not to touch, not to talk about this one subject that so far has not been able to be mentioned, which, which touches something that hurts. So to get the communication flow again. 
I also help families to find and identify their strengths, their resources, and to open up to new resources. Because when families come into therapy, this is often where they are. They are at the bottom of a hole. They only see a very small part of the sky. They barely see the sun. And they have forgotten all the plants that are growing around the surface of this hole. So we are trying to, to help the family to go back up and see the sun and all those resources around them again. Sometimes I have to help parents to take their place as a parent by parent support. We also allow children to go back to their place because sometimes children are taking the place of the parent, which is very tiring. This is, for example, the case of children who try to control everything in whatever way. This can be positive, this can be negative. I'm thinking of the enfant roi, the king child, who is alone on a mountain, very tiring for a child. When we have the enmeshed, the wool ball families, we try to unglue them, and I will show you an exercise of that. When we have the disengaged families, that is where we start to work, and then I try to bring them together with very precise propositions for creation. Some families that have like chaotic interactions, the father hits the daughter, the daughter goes out of the office and slams the door, people are fighting in the session, Sometimes you have to help them slow down, ask the children to bring in photographs of the family. Tell parents not to help the children to find out the family history and see how much the children know or do not know. When they don't know, they can then start asking the real questions to their parents and this can help quiet down families. Families that are becoming rigid, trying to do the same thing over and over again to to, to survive, help them to let go, become more flexible, get more resources in. What many families in difficulty forget is that everyone needs joy, good moments, every good moments. Everyone needs to take time off. And then towards the end of the therapy, we try to do real exercises to, to think and talk and work and put into images or volume the future project, projects. So this is, a this is a, an example of a genogram drawn by a father, uh, assisted by his son. This is the son who used to hide so perfectly that his mom and dad wouldn't find him back in their small Paris apartment. When the father tried to started to draw his genogram, which is um, the structure, the family structure going from generation to generation. We found out that it was a Jewish family who had been very harshly hit by a genocide, by the Shoah, the Second World War. And when the father started to talk about the Second World War, he couldn't speak anymore. The son of 11 years old got up, went to the paper, and wrote down in French, Second World War. The son also signified that this was a family where from generation to generation to generation, it was a family of, of jewelers working with diamonds, having their own jewelry companies. The son himself was, was very, very creative. So these are also moments where you can signify the qualities of families, not just their losses, their non-integrated losses. This is a typical exercise for enmeshed families, the ones that can't defusionalize. So what I propose to the four family members, for example, is to take one sheet of paper, this is like 50 by 65 centimeters, and to make a simple shape, to then turn the sheet of paper 90 degrees, and on top of the drawing of the person to their left, make a second uh, simple uh, um, representation, line, circle, triangle, whatever they want. To do that three and then four times when there are four family members. I then ask them to take the initial position 
of the paper in yeah. front. Yeah? Okay. Um, and then we cut the paper in four. And then everyone with his own associations works on his part. This is an exercise that helps family members that are very close unglue and start to identify their own joys, their own needs. So this is called differentiation and individualization. This was the exercise that I was going to propose to you to do it with the two, like in binome, and two people of yours. But since we're working through Zoom, uh, I couldn't do this exercise with you. This is something I proposed to a disengaged family to whom I made several propositions in volume and also here um, uh, and work on paper, helping them to get a little bit connected. These were two um, artist parents with a child, an only child who had grown up, having learned to be very, very independent, but she was suffering from nightmares. I proposed to the family to position their drawings each one had three drawings of the past, the present, and the future, to put them together, talking together, deciding together which drawing would be where on the sheet. This was the very first time I, they succeeded in, in getting closer. Not easy. Then there is the systemic family shield which with um, systemic, purely systemic therapists is done for a big part um, in writing. But the metaphoric object that represents the family is always asked to do as an image. Then here they are asked, the family members, either together or everyone for himself, depending on the type of the family. Uh, or a couple sometimes, to draw, to draw or write about the past, about the present, and about the future. And then to write the family motto. This girl wrote uh, for the family motto, enough. And I said, enough? She said, yes, you told me that I was good enough, that what I did was good enough, that life is good enough. Okay. But then, what, what would be your family motto? And she wrote above it, go forth and venture. This was the end of this therapy. Then this was an American-Canadian family. Um, we didn't have the time to do all five aspects of the family shield, so we just did the image of the family, the present, and the future. Because this family was at the point of moving back or moving, and they didn't know yet where, in fact, um, trying to project themselves in towards the future. So this family, the parents who did this sheet, saw, saw themselves as a tree. Um, and they also saw themselves uh, in the present as being a chameleon, being very adaptable to every new environment. This expatriate family was moving often with two adolescent children. And, but they were able to project themselves in the future without their children finding back the basis of their couple. So when people make this kind of a drawing, they take their time. When this is done in words, yes, you can talk about it and take the time to elaborate it. But when you draw about it as well, you integrate it like in your body. You integrate it by looking at it visually. It's really multi-sensorial. Then the daughter, who was 17, um, there was a possibility of them moving to the States and she was very much longing for um, living on her own or with flatmates. So she draws the family as a bear, strong as a bear, with honey. Um, four family members not knowing where they were going to move to in like two months. But she was now, through this drawing, telling her parents, who said, no, it's too early that you move out of, out of our home. She is indicating to her parents that she feels like moving, having a dog, and being in a flat share. 
I sometimes combine systemic art therapy with other approaches, like nonviolent communication. This can be done in family. Uh, and also with cognitive behavioral tools, I have a change spiral, which is done in writing, but can also be done in, in drawings. And this can also be done as, as a homework task. Uh, recently, I have started increasingly to offer uh, video sessions, uh, a bit like today. So it allows working during lockdowns. I ask the family to position the camera on the side, like at the end of the table where I am usually seated so that I can see the interactions of the people and see more or less what they are making and they can show me what they have done. Um, uh, but we can, and we can also include family members that are living abroad. Okay, this is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Hey, thank you very much, Alice. That was very, very interesting. Oh. I, I learned a lot. Um, what I would like to do is we have several people here. No one has and chatted a question in a chat function, no. but, um, it, I would like to open it up to anyone who has questions for Alice. You can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask her at this time. Yeah. I understand we have some people who are in, uh, who work either in art therapy or systemic therapy. Perhaps there's something you could share. Yes. That's possible. Hello, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm Sophie Morrison. And, yeah. Um, you mentioned working at the moment uh, by video. Yes. Um, and uh, this is what I've been doing with the child, doing art therapy. Um, the difficulty is, is uh, keeping uh, the framework uh, it's easier in one's office where we have the material, we have the, uh, the space itself. So I was wondering yes. how you handled this, uh, this um, space that is theirs, where it can, so many things can happen yeah. outside of, of a proper therapeutic space. Yeah, yeah. I try to do with the family situation of the child, and this is also related to the loyalty conflict that I talked about, um, and also realizing that a child who is working at home, I don't know if this is your, your, the situation with this child that you are working with. Yeah. But yeah. The child, yeah. Okay. The child working at home um, cannot necessarily express itself as freely um, as it can in individual session in our office. I propose to, to my clients to leave all their work in the office until the end of the therapy or of a phase of the therapy. Um, I have checked with children, because the children of the CESAD that we cannot receive um, in the office right now. Uh, I do uh, individual sessions with the kids and some of them are working in the living room. Family members are passing by. So sometimes I ask, can you concentrate? Um, and sometimes family members hear this and, and propose then to leave the, the child uh, in, uh, with more quietness and, and leave the room. But this is not always possible. So I do, as a systemic family, a, a systemic therapist, I, I try to do with the little brother who comes into my screen and says, hello. And I say, hi. And then I ask at the child that I'm working with, do you allow me to say hello to your little brother and to have me explain to your little brother that this session is for you? And then the child can say yes or no. But his brother hears that there is a little bit of attention for him. For me, the child is so connected, so interconnected to his family members that I can't just say, oh, stop. That would be probably counterproductive. That is true for the parents as well. So now we've been working for almost two months with our kids through um, video uh, therapy. Um, I work with SMS or with WhatsApp, um, trying to see if the parent is open to the thought of organizing the session in a separate room. Some parents can and want to, and some parents don't. 
And when they don't, I, I accept the situation. Does this answer you? Thank your you. Question? Yes, it's very clear. Thank you very much. And the presentation is very, very interesting. Thank you very, very okay. much. Hmm. You're welcome. Uh, Nialani, you had a question. Perhaps you want to ask directly, if you don't mind. Nialani? Uh, well, Nialani was asking, um, yeah. how often do you see families with multi-generational trauma? And is it more common than we realize? So sorry. It is. I um, couldn't figure out the button to unmute because I closed my, my screen. Okay. So sorry. So thank okay. you. Okay. So, um, I think it is very common. I think transgenerational traumatization is very common. Some families um, succeed in integrating the traumas that, fam that the family has gone through, uh, and some families don't. Um, it is those families who come into therapy because by themselves, they have, or with other professionals, uh, they have not succeeded in integrating the sufferance that is living, that is circulating within the family, and that the sponge child who makes symptom is showing us. Uh, so with the families that I receive, it is extremely uh, uh, current. Um, so when children are like from 10 years old on, um, the making of the genogram in presence of the children can be so interesting. Like this child who was hiding, who was 11 years old when we did the genogram. The genogram of the father and the mother were so similar, I could superposition them. And they, and they, uh, they uh, acknowledged that. Um, and when I asked him, well, did you know this, this history of your two families he said no but he said it in a way he was like sat, sitting back in the chair that he'd been behind uh, of, that he'd been underneath of but he was when that question when it was clear to him and it was drawn to him what both families had gone through there was like this peace this understanding in him that his symptoms his difficulties we're not coming from him, but from the family. So this takes away so much weight. And it, it, I, I talk about family backpacks. It makes family backpacks often so much lighter when the family succeeds in talking about the family history. And we contextualize it with immigration, with loss, um, and with war. Those are the three subjects that I encounter most in the hurt uh, that families bring into the office. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And okay. uh, just a quick follow up. When you, yeah. when you see that uh, complexity, you're treating the family, but do you often recommend that, you know, I, I would recommend that maybe the father or the mother take a few sessions individually so we can work on it, or you do. You, you do encourage the individual plus the family group. That really depends. I don't, did you finish your question? Yes, yes. Okay, that depends on um, the objectives, on the work objectives of the family, and it depends if they, the family has young children or older children. Um, for example, the family with the child who has selective mutism. Um, the, the goal with those parents is to uh, see if the mother who turns out to be quite depressed, who is following therapy elsewhere, um, if she finds enough support in that family outside the family therapy sessions with me, um, but how to get her back into being a mother present for her children, um, helping her son get back to his position of the child because the son is occupying himself a lot of his sister and that is not his position, it's not his place, it's not his function. So how can I help the parents to become stronger and to become parents 
to assume the role of the parent. And this should be done without the children present. Hmm. Um, however, there's this other family with, um, where the daughter is 21 years old. She has eating disorders. The father is, um, is the hard drugs addict. And the mother tells me that she feels codependent. Um, at one point, the mother wanted to evoke something that concerned um, the couple, so the father and the mother. And the daughter said, oh, wait, I do not want to be present. I know more or less what you want to talk about, mom, but either you talk about it um, in another session or I, I just go to the waiting room. We decided for that session that the daughter would go for a little while to the waiting room so that the mother could talk about, uh, about this event. And uh, at a certain point, this was enough. I called back, I proposed to the daughter to come back into the session. And I announced that in agreement with the parents that the next session would be a session with just the parents and that the following session would again be a session with the three of them. So it depends. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions okay. by chance? Okay. Yeah, if, if I may. Yes, yes. please. Hello. Yes. Uh, lovely. It's just great to, to join um, everyone today. Uh, and I feel quite bad that I didn't know about Sprint before, so I'm really pleased about this group. Thank you for your presentation. I learned so much. Thank you. Um, I'm more an academic. Um, I teach psychology here in Paris, and yeah. as well as at Paris 8. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I am less involved in therapy. What I'm very interested in is the cultural psychology, the psychology of migrating families. Yeah. And I was just wondering whether in your experience um, you have encountered how or moments or experiences of abuse, abuse of the children of migrating families and how that works in family therapy, talking about that and resolving those issues. Yeah. I know this is pretty heavy. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge subject. <laughs> your subjects, yes, exactly, yes. and uh, I have some yeah. experience with uh, uh, the Oxford Sexual Abuse uh, Center, yeah. but with migrating families, I find it just fascinating, and I just thought if, yeah. if yeah. you want to share some insight on that, I, and I'd I, love to have a, a copy of your presentation if it's possible. The, the presentation will be available. I, I, Sita, perhaps you want to you wanna explain perhaps later on how yeah, the sure, documents sure. are available. But I will also provide, if, if people are interested, a PDF version of this presentation, but without the photos of the personal, present, of uh, the personal work. I have authorization of everyone whose work has been shown today. But I've, it's, some therapies are, are just too recent or still uh, en cours. So I, I wouldn't like those, um, those photos to be available on, on internet. Um, personally, I have worked with, um, um, with a woman whose sister was abused by their father. Um, there had been immigration, but she was, her parents were not the generation that had immigrated. Um, in the, at the Sessad, we have a Jewish uh, family um, who has been go going through migration, but many generations before. There is no real incest, but the family shows incredible incestuous behavior. The father is um, schizophrenic. Uh, he stopped working recently. Um, but for years now, the son, the child that we are working with in the Sessat, who has behavioral uh, troubles, um, has been sleeping with his father in the bed of his father. There are the doors uh, in that apartment are always open. 
the doors of the bedrooms are not closing. So it's, it's really this enmeshed family uh, system. Um, I think it is, um, it is somehow, it can be a very logical expression of intense suffering that parents become too close to their children because the outside world is, has been experienced as so dangerous that all needs have to be met within the family. This can lead to incestuous situations and this can lead to incest. That is, I think, most of what I have as experiences. It's, it's not a specialty uh, of mine. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Other questions? Anybody else? No. Okay. Just again, yes, this presentation is recorded um, and probably will be available starting tomorrow or the weekend um, with a link that we put up right under the announcement itself on the Sprint France website and eventually on the Sprint website itself. Um, mm -hmm. We essentially it takes you to a YouTube channel. Uh, so if you find the Sprint YouTube channel, which I don't have the direct link for right now, you can, you'll probably see last week's presentation with Granier Dunleavy, as well as Elsa's and any future ones um, that hopefully we'll have. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, if there aren't any more questions, um, I guess we'll let's stop there. Um, else, thank you very much for this very interesting thank presentation. You. I mm -hmm. think um, a lot of us uh, learned some new ways to look at uh, the kids that we see, even if we will not be working with them the way you do. It opens mm -hmm. our eyes to how complex situations can be and how there's different ways yeah. to look at it. Yeah. Um, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to you all. Thanks to Sprint.